Hello and welcome to Dialogue. And China embarks on a new journey to build a modern socialist country in all aspects in the wake of the 20th CPC National Congress. What does this mean for China's economic growth? What is the message to the outside world? How do countries, including those in the Middle East, see China's role over the next five years and more? At the same time, the Syrian government has launched fresh accusations against the U.S. of stealing barrels of oil and wheat from the country and then transporting them to U.S. military bases in Iraq. After 11 years of fighting, what losses have the country and people endured during this civil war that seems to have no end in sight? To help us answer these questions and more, I'm glad to be joined by the director of the Diplomatic Institute in the Syrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Expatriates, Mr. Imad Mustafa, who is also the former Syrian ambassador to China. That's our topic. I'm Xu Qinduo. Welcome to the discussion, Ms. Ambassador. So during this just concluded CPC National Congress, the Communist Party of China you know, repeated its foreign policy and its strategy. Uh, you, know, you know China very well. You have been following the Chinese development. So what is the message from this Congress, from this very important meeting? Well, first, uh, hello to you and to the Chinese people, and congratulations for this very successful conclusion of the 20th Congress. I believe that this was a historic landmark because uh, it re-emphasized that China is constant in its direction, uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics, and in addition to this, the focus on national security and holistic development. I believe this is a very balanced view for the future. Mm -hmm. As you said, uh, Mr. Ambassador, the, um, obviously the, the report and the, the message, many people would say uh, there is a continuity of the Chinese development uh, in terms of the path, in terms of uh, the goals, you know, uh, in the next decades, a few decades, let's say. And so, uh, obviously, there is a stress emphasis on development. Uh, you know, uh, high quality of development is, uh, is basically the priority and the foremost task for the party uh, to lead the nation to modernization. Uh, tell us more about you know, why China is stressing so much about high quality development. I believe that in the past, in the, in the past, China was focusing a little bit more on economic growth. And of course, they did achieve spectacular results on this level. Today, China is the world's second largest economy, but in many aspects, it's the leading economy in the world. However, I think with the wisdom of the Chinese leadership, they are now shifting the attention or the focus or the emphasis from economic growth to total, total holistic development, uh, which means they are focusing now on not only on economy, but also on environment, on human development, on health, on education, on, uh, on, uh, on a balanced, balanced uh, uh, prosperous, mildly prosperous, using the Chinese terms, and, uh, and uh, quality life for the people in China, but also for the environment and the ecology of China. Above all, above all, what I believe is very important in this uh, holistic development approach is the profound understanding of the Chinese leadership and the absolute commitment to move China from an industrial manufacturing society to a society of innovation and creativity. With creation and, and innovation, you don't only uh, push forward the economy, but the whole society, because humans who are creative and who are innovative are happier, I believe, than humans who are uh, uh, contributing towards the economic growth through production and manufacture. Mm -hmm. Well, as you said, Ambassador, you know, uh, in the report, it does, you know, stress very much about the Chinese-ness of modernization, uh, which means, yes, there are uh, elements of modernization in terms of the concept as in other parts of the world, but also there are Chinese characteristics, Chinese features 
about what kind of modernization China wants to achieve. Uh, some would uh, even say, oh, it's modernization uh, does not mean westernization. What do you make of that? Well, let me, let me tell you a personal story. When I was appointed ambassador of Syria to China in, in uh, 2012, I was uh, a, a novice, a rookie, a beginner in the Chinese affairs. And I was a little bit, bit bewildered. I could not understand what is meant by, by uh, China's path towards socialism or socialism with Chinese characteristics. However, with time, with understanding, with learning, with observing and with uh, uh, education, I gradually understood the great importance of this uh, uh, approach, or let me say of this vision which is uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. Eventually, at, by the very end of my posting in China, I started writing and publishing articles in Syrian uh, media and newspapers explaining what is meant by uh, uh, Chinese socialism, or sorry, let me say socialism with Chinese characteristics, because uh, I was bewildered at the beginning, but when I understood, I thought it would be my duty and my mission to explain this to my countrymen, my fellow uh, people, Syria, back in Syria. So uh, what I want to say is the key word, as you have mentioned, uh, is modernism doesn't mean to blindly follow the European style. I have said this before, and I will say it, say it again. The greatness today for, of China, as far as we are concerned, and I mean by we, non-Chinese people, is that China has successfully offered us, offered humanity, an alternative model to the Chinese, to the Western uh, capitalist, uh, so-called quote-unquote liberal approach to uh, governance and to economy. They used to claim that regardless of how you can criticize our system, it's the only successful system. And this was a, a, a deep problem for political thinkers. Then China came and said, this is untrue. I can offer a, maybe even a more successful model for governance uh, that is not capitalistic and that is not uh, serving the interests of the few. So the success of the Chinese model of modernization and development does not only reflect on the prosperity and well-being of the Chinese people, but it also reflects on the whole world, because it is loudly saying, uh, yes, there is an alternative model for development, while in the capitalist system, the system caters and cares for those who have money. Uh, in the socialist system of Chinese characteristics, it's the interests of the whole population that the system cares for. Mm -hmm. Well, Ambassador, as you said earlier about innovation, innovation is important to the economic development, in particular high quality economic growth. Uh, but at the same time, we know that the U.S. is basically launching a technology cold war against China. For example, the latest move being uh, imposing this sweeping ban of uh, export of uh, semiconductor products. Uh, obviously, the U.S. is trying very much to prevent the continuous development of China. Uh, China is, is basically being forced to focus on its own efforts and indigenous innovation. Uh, are you confident that China is going to overcome that kind of, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, the moves by the U.S. Uh, to prevent it from continuous growth and China will continue uh, to develop, including the technology uh, sector? Thank you. This is a very important question and I believe this sector the sector of uh, technology, of high tech, and of uh, the semiconductors industry will be the most interesting sector to watch by observers and those who study China abroad, including myself. Because I believe, and I, I think that Chinese leadership does have the understanding and the determination that they will not continue to, to depend on Western technology particularly in the very sensitive and very strategic uh, sector of semiconductors. Uh, uh, I, I understand very well 
that the Western powers led by the United States of America are very, very worried about the quantum leaps that China has achieved in many sectors in the high-tech field, such as in artificial intelligence, as an example, or in quantum physics, quantum uh, communication system. The list is very long. I'm not going to enumerate every achievement that China has uh, attained in the past two decades. What I'm trying to say is, yes, the Western powers now are extremely worried. They are very unhappy about the success that China is achieving, and they believe that uh, they they should put every obstacle, every hindrance possible uh, that would prevent China from continuing to move forward. Now, the Chinese leadership did understood this, and I believe in the past, uh, at least past 10 years, the Chinese leadership now is focusing more and more on what is called core technologies, and with particular emphasis on the semiconductor uh, infrastructure industries. Uh, I believe in China, I'm very optimistic. I believe in the Chinese people. I believe that China will go beyond its dependence and the need for certain core technologies from the West. And I think the only path forward for China is the path of progress and of innovation and of uh, uh, attaining the highest possible levels of creativity. Mm -hmm. Well, this is uh, more or less related to these uh, international relations. Uh, on that direction, uh, China reiterates uh, that it will never seek hegemony or engage in expansionism, and it stands firmly against all forms of uh, hegemony and power politics, Cold War mentality, interference in other countries' internal affairs. Uh, what do you make of the Chinese foreign policy direction here? Well, let me start by telling you that imperialistic hegemony is the essence, is the soul of the capitalist uh, systems that prevail in the West. Uh, China, throughout its history, throughout its history, has been a peaceful nation. Uh, China is, has never been known to send its fleets or armies or troops to occupy uh, other nations and to, to build empires. Uh, but that was through the history of China. Now that we are talking about China as a socialist country that adheres to the principles of uh, socialism uh, and aspires to become uh, uh, an idealistic communist society at one point in its future history, I think China has a very, very principled approach to foreign policy. I believe that uh, Ch China has... Uh, always played a, a positive, constructive role of engagement with all nations on earth without any hesitation, without any uh, ulterior motives. Uh, China has been a great aid to Africa, and I believe the African nations are very grateful to China for what China has done in helping them achieving certain objectives in their development uh, plans. I believe that the initiative of uh, of uh, leader Xi Jinping, uh, the IDAO EU uh, initiative uh, is, is, is based on the core of, uh, of shared interests for humanity and win-win cooperation. Uh, China foreign policy is based on win-win cooperation. Uh, uh, in, in sharp contrast to the foreign policies of the Western powers led by the United States of America, which are about hegemony, aggression, occupation, destroying the other, weakening everybody else, and, and uh, defending their monopoly on the governance of the world. Let's have a short break. We will continue our discussion right after this. Throughout their 200 years of history, they have never ever even thought of respecting the sovereignty of any other country. The United States was established on genocide of the indigenous people. They all agree that the United States is governed, governed by the one person, through the one person and for the one person. Uh, the United States with, with its reckless policies and its arrogance will lose eventually uh, its control and domination of the world financial system. Uh, it is already happening now. 
and as I said, uh, this could be for the, the, for, for the good of humanity. Welcome back. Let's move on to uh, your country and also the U.S. You know, there is uh, the latest accusation of U.S. stealing oil and wheat from your country and then transporting those stuff to their military bases in Iraq. This is not the first time the U.S. has been accused of doing, engaging in such a behavior. Uh, what's really going on here? I mean, why the U.S. is stealing oil and wheat from, from a country like Syria? I mean, the country has been suffering enough. Well, first, let me please uh, slightly disagree with you on one thing. These are not accusations. These are absolute facts. We have been repeating these facts publicly and, and reporting them to the United Nations Secretary General and the United States of America never denied them never even attempted to deny it. Not even the U.S. media tried to deny the fact that on a daily basis, uh, 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 a large number of oil tanks, tankers, leave Syrian territories that are occupied by the United States troops, particularly the, the largest oil field in Syria, Al Omar oil field, leave towards Turkey or towards Kurdistan or Iraq. We don't know what happens to that oil there, what we only know is that the richest country in the world uh, is is practicing is practicing illegal high seas piracy. Of course, it's not in the sea; it's in the Syrian territory. But this is piracy. This is theft. And yet, they have the temerity. They have the. Uh, they are brazen enough to claim that they want to talk about uh, world order and about world uh, governed by rules. And yet, on a daily basis, they steal the wealth of the Syrian people. As you have mentioned, Syria is already has a troubled economy. We are in a very weak state economically. Yet, on a daily basis, they steal the wealth of our nation. This oil is not the property of the Syrian government. It's the property of the Syrian people. And the United States of America, by doing this, is, is uh, allowing the, the last the last, uh, 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 um, how would I say, shred of claiming that they follow, uh, uh, they follow international law uh, to fall down. I think today the United States foreign policy is absolutely naked in, in the eyes of the world opinion with what is going on in Syria, the daily theft of our oil. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to the Ukraine issue, for example, the U.S. and its allies often stress very much about respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity. But now U.S., uh, you know, they have the, their military bases inside Syria or Iraq. Does that uh, a reflection of respecting sovereignty or territorial integrity? Because they are not in, invited by the Syrian government and the, the uh, presence is not supported and welcomed by the, by the Syrian people. Well, uh, don't be very unkind towards the United States by asking them to respect sovereignty of any country. Throughout their 200 years of uh, history, they have never ever even thought of respecting the sovereignty of any other country. The United States was established on genocide of the indigenous people, and since it was, its establishment, it launched a series of wars against Canada, Mexico, and other countries, and uh, kept on expanding and kept on sending its troops across the whole world. So today, asking the United States suddenly to respect the territory, uh, sovereignty, and uh, and national territories of any country would be uh, an anomaly, which means it is against the, uh, the, the uh, 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 intricate nature of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I wonder, you know, what kind of uh, you know specific economic losses for Syria and its people in terms of the U.S. Um, behavior of stealing the oil and wheat from from your country? Well, it's not only about stealing the oil and the wheat. You have to please remember that during the 10 years of conflict, the United States did actually arm and finance uh, terrorist groups in Syria. They continue to arm and finance one, at least one terrorist group today in Al-Tanaf. 
but uh, during the past 10 years, these terrorist groups with, with diplomatic, political, and financial support from the United States of America uh, attacked the infrastructure in Syria. I'm talking about electricity generation plants, water treatment uh, uh, plants, uh, dams, bridges, uh, public roads. And so the United States of America actually was uh, a partner in destroying the infrastructure of the Syrian people. Once again, this infrastructure is not the property of the Syrian government. It's the property of the Syrian people. Yet the United States of America says loudly that it supports the Syrian people. It's just against the Syrian government. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the theft uh, has not uh, received much media coverage in the West, uh, nor has it been condemned by, uh, say, European countries and other U.S. allies. Well, those countries, usually, they are quick to point a finger at any behavior like this by any other countries. What, what happened? Well, once again, we come back to the core problems of the West, so-called Western democracies. They don't have a free press. Actually, anyone who believes that there is a free media and free press in the Western country is incredibly naive because the media in the West only serves the interests of their pay masters, who happen also to be the political money, you know, controls the Western powers. So uh, they serve the interests of their pay masters. The military manufacturing industry serve the interests of their pay masters. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, these countries are ruled by the richest 1% uh, percentage, 1 percentage of the Western population. And only they serve their interests, even to the detriment of the interests of the people in those countries. So expecting the BBC or CNN or Agence France Presse to report honestly about what's happening in Syria or what's happening even in China uh, would be uh, beyond my wildest expectations. Uh, we know that uh, Syria the government and the people, they are trying very hard to recover uh, from the war and also they are rebuilding the nation. Uh, what is the state of uh, reconstruction? It's both good and bad. Uh, we are working so hard and we are achieving results. And I believe, I, I, I respect highly those great men and women who are working hard today for the reconstruction of Syria. I have been to Aleppo a month ago and I was impressed by the great efforts of rebuilding the damaged uh, old part of the city. I was touched. I was also grieved when I saw the other parts that are still destroyed and are still waiting for the reconstruction. What I want to say is we are working so hard. This is the good part of it. The not so good part is we are lacking resources. After 10 years of uh, attacking our infrastructure and after the and because of the continuous theft of our natural resources by the United States of America, we are depleted of resources. We are working so hard, but pace is slow because of the lack of resources. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ambassador, what's the involvement of, uh, of the Chinese the business community, Chinese companies, in terms of uh, reconstruction of the nation and also, in, in particular, uh, infrastructure construction, you know, which is where China is very uh, uh, strong at? And, of course, there's a Belt and Road Initiative, which primarily focuses on infrastructure construction. Uh, what kind of a role China may play in the reconstruction efforts? I believe that uh, China can play the greatest possible role, greater than any other country in the world, regarding the aiding Syria and its reconstruction efforts. Uh, China does have the will and does have the know-how, does have the resources, and we enjoy very warm political relations with China. Having said this, uh, there is a major obstacle, and Again, it's the United States of America who is imposing uh, the harshest possible sanctions regimen on Syria, which makes it very difficult for Chinese uh, companies and enterprises to engage on a large scale in the Syria reconstruction. However, the recent developments are a great indicator that 
China, Russia, many other countries in the world are liberating themselves steadily and gradually from the financial, world financial system that's dominated by the United States of America. The more progress this is achieved, it is achieved on this level, uh, the easier it will be for the Chinese companies and enterprises to engage more actively in, on, on, on the reconstruction of Syria. Mm -hmm. Well, Ambassador, speak of that. Uh, we know that the U.S. is abusing uh, the dominant position of the U.S. dollar and also U.S. financial strength, for example, imposing sanctions on Russia, China, Syria, Iran, and many other countries. And that kind of practice, actually, uh, plus the U.S. Uh, interest rate increase, which creates a lot of trouble for the developing world, and many people are looking for alternative transaction methods, for example, probably the more use of their bilateral currencies or the more use of the uh, Chinese yuan, in particular the digital yuan. Uh, do you see a prospect of uh, development in that direction so people can avoid the U.S. Uh, economic coercion and then do business as Europe between, between countries? Absolutely. It's inevitable, it's a historic inevitability that uh, uh, the United States with, with its reckless policies and its arrogance will lose eventually uh, its control and domination of the world financial system. Uh, it is already happening now. And as I said, uh, this would be for the, uh, for the good of humanity. Uh, nations need to be free from the control and, and hegemony of the United States of America. Even countries that have no, no political problems with the United States of America pay a dear price for the sub financial subjugation by their financial systems, subjugation uh, to the U.S. Uh, uh, monetary financial and banking system. Uh, all, all this is happening for the benefits of the capitalists in the United States of America. And this is only one example of the too many examples in which the United States of America abuse the whole world, not only Syria and the other countries that it, it is, uh, it is uh, uh, imposing uh, sieges and sanctions against. Uh, it, it, of course, the degrees are varying and different, but it is always happening everywhere. Even with their closest allies, they do this. They don't care. Uh, making money for the ruling classes in the United States of America is the only national interest of the United States of America. Well, a good example probably is the latest um, move by the U.S. or the threat by the U.S. Uh, to the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. and other OPEC plus countries. Like uh, if you dare basically to uh, reduce the oil production and the U.S. will impose sanctions. Uh, you know, Saudi Arabia is seen as a, as a U.S. ally. But if you dare to take moves that's uh, against the U.S. order, or against the U.S. interests, and then there is a threat. There, is, there are possible sanctions. Believe me, my dear friend, I am going to make another interview in which from the beginning to the end of the interview, I will list examples of how the United States of America untwisted its allies uh, economically and financially for her own benefits and advantages while damaging the interests of her friends and allies. The list is very long. With that, we come to the end of today's show. Many thanks to Mr. Imad Mustafa, former Syrian ambassador to China. You can also watch us on the CGTN app on YouTube. Thank you for being with us. I'm Xu Qinduo. See you next time.